In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, grant us concentration that, you, that we may learn, listen, understand, have a peaceful mind, and remember that you're with us always. Amen. So this video, we're going to start our discussion of ecosystem ecology, but I want to back up for a second and I want to answer the question that I ended the last video with, and that is the symbiotic relationship between the oxpecker and the large herbivores. And I ask you what type of relationship this was. And so my answer to whichever one you picked is most likely yes. That's correct, and this shows that these relationships are not obvious all the time. So some of you may have said this is a commensal relationship because the birds are benefiting because they're getting food on the insects they're picking off the back of the gazelle or the large herbivore. And the herbivores are benefiting because the ticks and other types of insects that may be present there are removed, and so they're benefiting too. And I would say, yes, that's a great idea. Some of you may say that it's, or that would be mutualism, I'm sorry. Some of you may say that it's commensalism, in that the oxpecker is getting food, but these gazelles are really not benefited or harmed by their presence there. And I would say yes to that too. Some of you may have said this is parasitic, okay? And how is it parasitic? Well, think of it this way. These birds are going to be um, using sight to be able to find the insects that they want to consume. And so if they mistake in a scab or an injury on the back of the herbivore, they may pick at that, which causes it to become infected, which affects eventually will harm the large herbivore. So yes, this could even be seen as a parasitic relationship. I lean towards mutualism because I think both are benefiting from this relationship. Maybe a little closer uh, to commensalism because the uh, large herbivores probably don't get a lot of benefit from this. Parasitism probably is a bigger stretch for this particular relationship. Okay, so now we're going to move on to ecosystem ecology. And so the study of ecosystem ecology studies the relationship and the interaction within all parts of the ecosystem. Okay, so we're talking about both the living organisms and the abiotic or the non-living portions of the ecosystem. So to start with this, I'm going to start with what is an ecosystem? Well, we can define it in various different ways, but I would say an ecosystem is a consideration of all the living organismal portion and the non-living, the mineral, the nutrient type portion of the environment too. And so the, it's going to be all of those aspects considered together. And a large part of this is going to be the study of how organisms affect changes in the non-living portion of the environment. Okay. How does, for example, the use of nutrients and resources by an animal affect the nutrient resources in their natural form, in the minerals, in the nutrients present in the soil. How does human activity impact the relationships of the non-living portions of the environment? And so we're going to break this down into two parts that we're going to look at. Elemental cycles, in other words, how the nutrients are used and reused or recycled through the environment as a result of the organisms present there, and then energy flow. Again, I always say energy flow because it's really only moving one direction, whereas nutrients, there's more of a recycling that's going to occur. Okay. So when we talk about ecosystems ecology, 
One of the considerations to start with is what we call ecological succession. Okay? And ecological succession is this idea of the movement and the growth or change in an ecosystem over time. And so this is going to involve, again, both the living and the non-living portions of the environment. So imagine we have a volcanic eruption, okay? And that's going to clear away all the living organisms that are present there. There may be a lot of nutrients, there may be a lot of different minerals in that that are present there, but they're not really available to most organisms. So when we see this, we're going to see the exposed rocks here, which is the beginning of it. Well, we need something to sort of start this cycle. And so lichens, we talked about lichens with the fungal section. Lichens are often the first organisms that will come in. This is the symbiotic relationship between a photosynthetic organism and as a fungus in that the fungus is protecting the photosynthetic organism and the photosynthetic organism is providing carbohydrates and other nutrients for that. And so when we have this, this would be establishment. This is the beginning of the process. And so the establishment occurs when the lichens start growing on there. As the lichens die, they're going to put nutrients back into the soil. They're going to recycle that in. They also will begin to break down the rocks. They're going to sort of cause cracks to form in them over time. Those rocks will break, break down. Okay. The next set we see coming in as it begins to get soil, okay, mosses will come in. Mosses don't need a lot of soil. They're able to grow on rocks and that, that are present there, but they do need some source of nutrients that, the, that will begin the process. Again, this further breaks down the rocks, but also begins to put organic matter that will form the humus, the topsoil that's present there. So that's establishment, the beginning of the process. Okay? The second step in this process is going to be facilitation. And so facilitation is where we begin to see grasses and weeds growing up there. We begin to see more mixture of plants being present there. And that's going to establish more organic material in the soil and begin to provide for depth of the soil. One of the important considerations here is the addition of nitrogen, uh, nitrogenous amino acids, and conversion of the nitrogen to usable sources. Okay, This facilitation allows for very large growth, and so we see it going up through the process where we go from our small greens up to shrubs, larger uh, plants. Then we get some young forest, the tulip poplars, uh, some of the ash might be in there. And then we begin to see a mature forest coming in in which we have larger trees, oaks and hickory it's showing in here. And eventually we get to a climax forest where we have a very large variety of different trees that are there, a nice, rich, thick soil uh, from the leaves and that that have been broken down again. Not mentioning the fungi here, but the decomposers are an important part of this, recycling nutrients back into the soil that will allow them to continue. So once we reach the peak forest, this is going to be the final stage, which we refer to as inhibition. Okay? During inhibition, the forest will grow and continue to change and give us the mature trees that are present there. And so we no longer see the smaller shrubs in that that are present, but we see the larger forest that's active there. Okay. And so this is sort of a cycle or sort of a growth where we go through this. And so one of the important considerations, and I've talked a little bit about nutrients, but one of the important considerations here is going to be energy flow and what energy sources are available to that. So as a little reminder, we're referring to this as energy flow simply because it's really moving in one direction. Okay, And why is that? Well, a little reminder, the first law of thermodynamics 
says that energy is not created or destroyed, but changes from one form to another. The second law, which is really where it becomes the flow interest, the second law says that in the biological system, all things are moving towards disorder or entropy. In the case of biological systems, this disorder is typically seen as the release of heat. Heat is not a very good source of energy for plants and animals to use to collect energy from. Okay. And so we're going to see this flow occurring, and it always goes from sunlight is where it all begins, okay? And sunlight is the beginning energy there, and that's going to be used by autotrophs, the photoautotrophs, the plants, that will collect sunlight energy and use that by photosynthesis. There are chemoautotrophs, too, that may be active in here, but they're going to collect the light energy and use non-organic sources, carbon dioxide, to be able to create organic material. Okay. And so once that organic material is, is collected, then the energy can flow from the autotrophs to the heterotrophs. These are animals, or organisms, I shouldn't limit it to animals, that are going to use energy from other sources. And so they're going to eat the plants. They're going to consume them. We may consider decomposers here. They're going to be sort of hetero, or they're going to be heterotrophs that will use the dead material for their energy source. And so in the biological system, as we talk about this, we can talk about movement through the trophic levels. And the primary level are always the primary producers. And so the primary producers, the plants, the chemoautotrophs could be in there too. But plants being the primary source uh, of energy capture from the sun that will then become food for the first or second trophic level will be the herbivores. And the herbivores will consume the plant material, capture the energy from the plants, and use that for their own growth. They, in turn, provide energy that will be used by the primary carnivores. These are animals that are eating other animals and are going to be used up there, with the last tropic level being secondary pre uh, predators, secondary carnivores that are going to be present in there. All of this is everybody dies. And so all of the energy of the dead matter or waste products that are produced by these can then be shuffled through the detritivores and the detritivores decomposers are going to capture that energy and make the final use of, or recycle that. Eventually all that energy, or not all that energy, but a lot of the energy is going to be lost in the process. So one consideration when we talk about energy flow is going to be how well or how productive, okay, productivity is an important consideration. And so what do we mean by productivity? Well, productivity is a measurement of the rate of synthesis of new organic material. So basically we're talking about the efficiency of photosynthesis, how much you're able to grow. And productivity is going to be related to both the temperature, the moisture, and nutrient availability. If there's more nutrients available, more moisture available, that means productivity is going to be higher. And so we break this down into two different types. The autotrophs will be the primary producers, okay? And so they're going to have two different types. We're going to have gross primary productivity. And gross primary productivity is simply the total amount of organic matter that's formed here. Okay. So that's going to be the total amount of organic matter produced.
Okay, so this is just simply saying how much energy can a particular area capture and turn into organic matter. Net primary pr productivity, in addition to the amount produced, also considers the amount used by the producers. Okay, so how much energy they take in? Keep in mind that plants, in addition to doing photosynthesis, are also going to be using metabolism to break down some of the sugar that they're creating that will then be released as heat or being used by the animal. So not all the energy captured is necessarily going to be passed to the next trophic level. And so net primary productivity is going to be the gross primary productivity minus the amount of energy used by the primary producers. So when we think about that, energy is going to be captured in organic forms. Well, heterotrophs, although they're not primary producers, we can refer to these as secondary producers or secondary productivity. In other words, the animals themselves are capturing energy from the primary producers and are using that to store in their own bodies and how they grow. So secondary productivity in this case is going to be the consumer's use of energy from the primary productivity. For the most part, when we consider productivity, we're really referring to the autotrophs and how much energy they're able to capture. So when we talk about energy flow, an important thing to keep in mind is that a lot of energy is lost in each step as we move up through there. So this is showing energy flow of a system. So only about 1% of the solar energy that comes to Earth is actually absorbed and used by the plants. Most of that energy is simply released, released as heat. Well, you should be happy about that because that maintains the temperature on Earth and we need warm environments to be able to survive. So 1% is transferred through there and roughly speaking, we could say about 10% of the energy from each level is passed to the next level. Okay, And so the point here is that a lot of energy is lost. Okay? Very little is going to be actually maintained. Well, where is it lost? Well, some is lost in respiration. Okay, Some is lost through death. Okay, Some of that can be recaptured in the form of the detrivores, but eventually they respire too, and we lose energy there. So loss of energy is there. Only a small amount is actually captured to be able to think about that. Okay, This is looking at the relationship between a grasshopper here eating on a leaf. Okay, About half the energy that's captured or consumed by the animal is immediately lost as feces. This is undigestible material, material that will be simply passed through the organism. Another 33%, roughly speaking, is going to be lost to cellular respiration. Animals that have to, prey animal, or predators that will be chasing down their prey may actually use even more than 33% of their energy. So less energy is captured in this case, we're showing 17% as being the amount of energy that's just captured. Now, on the previous slide, I just told you only about 10% is actually captured. Well, maybe a little bit better, depending higher or lower, depending on the tropic level. Now, this has a very important consideration when we start talking about natural systems. So this is looking at the efficiency of transfer within the Cuyahoga, Lake Cuyahoga, New York ecosystem. Okay, And so what we're looking at here is the steps. So this would be your primary producers, the algae and the cyanobacteria, photosynthetic organisms that are capturing sunlight. The 
primary consumers or the herbivores are the plankton, the other small microorganisms that are present in there that will be consuming that. They in turn are going to be ate by small fish, the smelt, which again will be consumed by the carnivores, trout being an example here, which will then be consumed by humans. And here's the point, okay, that if we're talking about 1,000 calories being captured in the photosynthetic organisms, okay, if we are eating trout or consuming trout, only about 1.2 or 0.1% of that energy actually is reaching us. And so it takes a very large number of primary producers to support a much smaller number of carnivores. Think about agriculture, okay? What are most of the animals that we consume? Well, think of your cows, your pigs, your chickens. These are animals that we produce for meat products. The, you should note in there that they all said, with the possible exception of pigs, but primarily pigs are herbivores, that these are all herbivores, which means it's going to take less energy to produce them. If we were producing carnivores as a primary food source, we not only would need to produce the grass or the food that they're going, that the animals that they're going to eat are going to eat, but we need to have that intermediate. Less energy is available to be passed down. So we see in some of this that when we talk about these tropic pyramids, we can see how the relationships are present there. So this is an example of a tropic pyramid. And again, related to energy use, where we see the same thing, where we see the biomass of photosynthetic organisms present that are being able to support a very much smaller number of herbivores or much smaller biomass and even smaller biomass of the carnivores. If we put a second level carnivore on here, the biomass is significantly less. The numbers are dramatic. You know, it takes 40 or 4, 4 billion of our photosynthetic plankton to support one herbivore or one carnivore, which would be supplied by 11 herbivores. So the energy consideration here is very important. When we look at the difference in these organisms, you can see how the primary producers or productivity of an area can be very important in what types of carnivores or other organisms that might be present there. And we also see that there can be shifts in this. There can be changes that occur that will impact the food web and how this is connected. So on this slide, we're looking at the right, okay? The right side of the screen is swarming. We could say this is the normal system. So in the normal system, there's a balance that has occurred, okay? So we have a certain amount of algae that's present there. They're going to be consumed by the insectivores, okay, or the herbivore, herbivorous insects. Um, if you guys haven't done it yet, that's a midge that's going to be there. And that population is going to be controlled by the number of carnivorous. In this case, we're saying damselflies, which in turn is going to be regulating, regulated its population by the number of fish that are present there. So if we have human influence, in this case, removing the top predator, okay, if there's no fish in the system, we see an imbalance develop. Because there's no fish to remove the carnivores, the carnivore population of insects will become very high, which means we reduce the number of insect or herbivorous insects, which means the LG begins to grow out of control and therefore, we've disrupted the system. So the energy flow allows you to sort of determine how it's going to occur. Because the fish are eating so many of the carnivorous insects, that means that they're going to regulate the population and reduce the number of 
herbivorous insects that are eaten, which again will maintain a normal algae population. The loss of that shift in energy because more energy shifted to these carnivorous insects, then we lose the balance that should be present there. So it's an important to understand these naturally occurring balances and how they occur. We're going to end this video here on energy flow. The next video will pick up our ecosystem ecology, talking about nutrient cycles and some of the implications and imbalances that can occur there. So thank you again for watching this video. As always, if you have questions, please post them on the discussion boards on Schoology and or contact me and we'll make sure you get an answer. Thank you.